You know, brother, and I don't know about you, but every time it seems like I watch the History Channel, more times than not, more times than not, I stumble across a program on aliens or UFOs, flying saucers, green men from Mars or Venus or wherever they may be, and they continue to promote this idea about aliens from another, you know, planet, another galaxy, light years away. They've traveled here and they've uh, basically uh, interplayed with mankind. As a matter of fact, some shows even propose the uh, hypothesis of the fact that we're nothing more than offspring of some of these alien visitors from another planet. And, you know, I can't help but to uh, find some of this stuff somewhat intriguing and interesting. And over the years, I must admit, I must admit, I've read a book or two or three on some of this stuff, like uh, Chariots of the Gods, you know, which was quite curious at best and uh, certainly does raise some questions with regards to uh, some of these things as to, you know, what, where did all this stuff come from? How, how is this possible? I mean, it does sound realistic. I mean, some of this stuff does indeed sound real supernatural if you would use those kinds of terminologies there's even this lady named Dolores uh, Cannon she's got a book out called the custodian beyond abductions she calls it she goes back probably to the 1960s or so she's kind of an elderly lady now with gray hair looks like a little grandma kind of typical uh, grandma but she's a uh, what you would call essentially a hypnotherapist uh, and catalogs what she considers lost knowledge from past lifetimes. And she, through hypnosis and so forth, attempts to therapeutically put many of her clients through certain rigors uh, to recall back their life's experiences and or influences. And she even claims that through multiple clients that she's had on her customer list who she had hypnotized, have actually brought to the surface actual encounters that she has had with Nostradamus, who talked to her through these people that were her clients. Multiple different personalities of different people, of course, uh, who she claims were indeed uh, basically identifying themselves as Nostradamus. There are people that do claim, in fact, that they've been abducted by aliens taken off and up into the spaceships. We even had a cult here a while back, I forget the name of it now, where they all killed themselves thinking that they were going to go on that comet. Uh, and the result was they found all the bodies and everything, suicide uh, that uh, they did to themselves, thinking that they had to be reunited or reconnected with this comet that was passing by Earth. But there are people who believe that they've been abducted, taken to spaceships, actually probed and picked and experimented with and, and suffer psychological trauma as a result of these experiences. And you, you sit there and you think, well, you know, what do you do with this? Because people literally are traumatized. They are really traumatized. I mean, you can't take that away from them. Even if you say, well, it's all in their heads, the fact of it is, it's there and something caused it, something happened to them, because in some cases, some of these people are not knuckleheads. I mean, there are policemen out at night in the roads and doing their, what you could say, um, circuit, you know, patrolling their neighborhoods and areas who have literally seen what they believe to be authenticated UFOs, documented airplane pilots, Aerospace engineers. I had a buddy that used to fly for United in the Worldwide Church of God. He was an aerospace engineer, but he was a pilot too. Now, he didn't see any UFOs, but I'm just saying these guys are well-educated guys, military people that fly F-18s claim that they've seen UFOs, which means unidentified flying objects. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a flying saucer, but it is in most cases the, the attachment, the connection, the notion that's given is that it's a flying saucer. It's something that's alien. It's something that's non-human as we would define it to be in the human realm and consequently uh, is indeed 
uh, foreign to our, to our dimension or to our natural dynamics. And it goes from the professionals to even common citizens to young people who oftentimes claim they have seen these things. As a matter of fact, there are clubs and associations. I've been on the internet throughout this whole week, looking, investigating, exploring, and studying some of these things that are available out there. It is mind-blowing. There are literally UFO societies. Right here in Cleveland, we've got a thing called the Cleveland Ufology Project. UFOlogy Project. They call it the Ufology Project. And it's right here in Cleveland. And they supply CDs, DVDs, they supply support groups to people who claim they've had encounters with these aliens. They have, they have actual uh, papers and things supporting the documented evidence of individuals who have visually seen things that they will not deny because they know what they saw and it was a reality as far as they were concerned that they really experienced this stuff. There's even this guy called Dr. Greer who heads up the center for the study of extraterrestrial intelligence who goes around lecturing, uh, takes position papers and so forth, is a very professional kind of guy, does workshops, uh, again he too sells books and DVDs and CDs and even has what I call a Ouija board on steroids. It's called, believe it or not, well, let me just read this to you. Let me just read this to you. I quote, and this is from their website, the ET contact tool. You may laugh, but follow me through this. I'm telling you, this is serious stuff. This is a doctor. This is Dr. Greer. And he states this on this website is a self-contained course on making contact with extraterrestrial beings, authored by Stephen M. Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, which includes working scientific instruments for detecting these anomalies. So it includes instrumentation, I got a picture of it, as well as a study course on how to make contact, how to dial them in so that they can talk to you. Notice this, it, it gets better. Dr. Greer is the director of the Center of the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He is widely regarded as the most credible and influential figure on the subject of ET contact. He has briefed astronauts, CIA directors, military and government officials, and people all around the United States and the world. This guy comes heavily uh, credited. Uh, he goes on here, he is also the father of a worldwide disclosure movement, which has recently led governments around the world releasing hundreds of thousands of previously classified documents on UFOs and ET related matters, emphasizing the reality and the importance of this issue. As a mediation instructor, that means meditation, because that's what the course is, you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. This is a full-blown course that takes you through techniques on how to meditate so that you can make contact. And then you have instrumentation that will verify the fact of whether or not someone or something else is in the room with you and if indeed you have made contact. That's why I say this is like a Ouija board on steroids. This is real stuff by a doctor, Stephen Greer, well-educated man. And he goes on and he says here, as a mediation instructor for over 30 years, he has pioneered techniques that combine meditation and remote viewing for making ET contact. He has trained thousands of people around the world in the use of these methods. The ET contact tool, the ET contact tool provides you with a full course in these techniques, which are techniques of meditation, as well as a suit of tools, literal tools, instruments, to help you make contact on your own. It includes over two hours of audio tutorials, guided meditations, and tones, it's a course, it's a course 
along with Dr. Greer's complete written guide on the science of making contact custom tailored. Are you ready for this? For your iPhone. <laughs> he has an app. It's an app for your iPhone or your Blueberry or Blackberry or whatever it's called. <laughs> so that you can put it on your phone. <laughs> Brother, this, this is real stuff. This is real stuff. I was stunned, shocked, and put back in my comfortable chair at my desk after seeing some of these things. And the fact of it is, and the sad part of much of this, is really so much human rationalization and humanistic reasoning in so many areas. And it's all underscored, and here's the sad part, it's all underscored by the hostility that mankind has naturally toward what we call revealed, revealed knowledge. Isaac read from the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The Koran is not the Word of God. This is the word of God, you see. This contains revealed knowledge. Now, many people, the vast majority of mankind, do not believe that this is revealed knowledge. There's only really approximately two billion people considered Christians on planet Earth, and if we gave them all the benefit of the doubt and said they all, at least fundamentally, who claim Christ as their Savior, believe this book, Old and New Testament, is revealed knowledge, still approximately five billion don't. Don't. Roughly the new number, by the way, of total people on planet Earth is about 7 billion today. And there's a little over two, roughly, that claim to be Christian. This book is revealed knowledge. And this book, if indeed people would believe it for what it says, they would see how nonsensical Dr. Greer is from the paradigm he's operating from. I don't doubt one moment, and this is the spooky thing about all this, I do not doubt one moment that his meditation course and his instrumentation might very well indeed get results, generate results, cause voices to be audibly heard to actually maybe even pick up some kind of physical transgression, crossover of something non-human that considered in his paradigm alien, considered in his framing something from another planet, but of which is not. Is not. And therein lies the danger of this, because most human beings on this planet who reject the revealed word of God don't have a clue on what they're playing with, don't understand at all what they're getting into and who they're poking. And believe you me, if you want a visitation, if you want an encounter of the first kind, I think that's the one where they're face to face, the, an encounter of the first kind, it is available to you. And yes, you can call them up and you can dial them in and they will be more than happy to oblige your desire to make contact with you. And they will be anything you want them to be. They will be your dead loved one. They will be whoever, Napoleon, Nostradamus. They're waiting, you see. And 
if you understand that from revealed knowledge, the information I'm talking about, you will understand that these are not aliens from another planet, but they are non-human beings from another dimension that are indeed interacting and walking around and existing in parallel with, not in a parallel universe, in parallel with us, invisible to the human eye, but walking and are as alive as you and I are, but of a different material, spirit material, of which they invisibly hide themselves in our dimension, so that unbeknownst to ourselves, we don't even know how close we get to them from time to time. Or, in some cases, because we're led to believe that once a composition of flesh is turned to spirit, whether you've walked through them, since they can go through the physical items of our physical dimension. And uniquely enough, don't get this in your mind as well, they're not all, if you understand from the revealed knowledge of your Bible, both Old and New Testament, they're not all bad guys. There are favored non-human beings among us, and there are disfavored non-human beings among us. Let me show you something here first as we get started with this. I've got a ton of scriptures, brethren, that I want to share with you. Turn with me real quickly here to Isaiah to introduce to you in an abbreviated fashion here where some of this begins. Isaiah chapter 14, real quickly. Revealed knowledge tells us by the prophet Isaiah here where he says in this particular case with regard to this fallen archangel Lucifer in the Latin, Heleo in the, he uh, in the, in the um, Hebrew, how art you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend unto the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars, that is, the other angels of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregations in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most, I will be like God. So this demon, so this fallen covering cherub, said he wanted to be. I will be like God. Yet you shall, the prophet states on behalf of God, brought down to Sheol, to the hole. You'll be brought down to the pit because you will not become like a God. Luke chapter 10, notice what happened here. In Luke chapter 10, we are told in this particular case uh, of an event that happened in history as a result of Satan's attitude. Jesus talking to the 70 that he sent out on an evangelistic mission in verse 17 of Luke 10, we read the 70 returned again with joy. They were happy because they said, Lord, even the devils, even the demons, they recognized demons at this time with the people that they were interacting with out in the field. They noticed the demons and they came back stunned, excited, and joyful over the fact that even those demons obeyed them when they told those demons to do certain things. And they were happy because they were confirming the authority of Jesus the Christ. And so there was a very happy moment here. And they came back, they said this to Jesus, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. And that Greek word there means that he was a spectator. He literally saw that. And we know that because Jesus preexisted. Jesus was there before Adam and Eve. Jesus was the creator of all the angelic hosts. Jesus is the creator God of everything that is in heaven and on earth. He is the ultimate creator and acted uh, in that particular fashion uh, on behalf of the Father who he introduced us to. Over here in Revelation chapter 12, real quickly here, and these are just short little snippets, but I want to lay down some foundation here to illustrate that in the book of the Bible, 
with revealed knowledge being accepted as a premise, a true premise, a right premise, the authentic premise, the real premise of life, you understand then the platform by which we are existing on. And in so, uh, in, and in so doing, we begin to see a certain, well, focus and hopefully uh, and, and come to a better understanding of what we are really involved with. Here, speaking somewhat symbolically in chapter 12, which is a thumbnail sketch of a lot of history, we read in um, this particular case, uh, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And we understand that to be basically the church, the woman, the 12 stars, number of perfect beginnings. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Talking about, of course, the manifestation and, and the... Um, incarnation of Jesus Christ and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a red dragon we understand that to be Satan having seven heads and ten horns and this imagery here associated with the beast and the false prophet which were essentially the manifestations of, of Satan the devil's efforts in the physical dimension his tail that is this red dragon his tail drew the third part of the stars and as I mentioned stars is symbolic for angels uh, of heaven and cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman the church which was ready to be delivered Jesus for to devour her child as soon as it was born well she brought forth the man child Christ did become incarnate and was uh, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne and of course we understand Jesus did resurrect the woman she fled into the wilderness figuratively speaking for the last 2,000 years the church has been in the wilderness of humankind's social systems scattered abroad scattered about like salt and pepper throughout the nations and throughout the peoples throughout the social orders over the millennia over the centuries some have died and given their lives over certain circumstances. Some thought they were part of the church, but never were. All kinds of mixes and machinations and conditions of the church over its course in the last 2,000 years of the wilderness of life. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. That is, the dragon did not prevail. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven for that dragon. And so the dragon was thrown out. The old serpent called, and now we see for sure, the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. So we come to this grip and understand that in the reality of the world we live in, Satan the devil had a relationship, a former relationship, with God the Father and Jesus Christ, but at some point became egocentric in his approach toward his relationship with God, rebelled, attempted actually to try to circumvent the authority of God of which he was thrown out of heaven as a result. However, he was able and successful in convincing one-third of the angelic host with him. And today, we have one-third of all of the angelic beings that have ever been created confined on this planet. And they're stuck. And they're trapped. And they are confined, constrained. Now, occasionally, they have rights to go here and there a little bit uh, beyond or at least Satan does, and we understand that later on we'll confirm that. But I want to now take us back. I want to take us back over to Genesis. Because with what I just stated, that lays the foundation for the ones that are in disfavor. Because remember, there are two groups of these non-human beings who do from time to time occasionally break through the reality of our world and make contact. And when I say contact, I mean contact. Now there are two types of contacts. Here in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, this is one of them. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision. 
Later on, we're told that in parallel with visions, they're like dreams. But they're real, and they are from God, and in particular cases, they happen when individuals sometimes are in a comatose kind of condition. But they are, in fact, real. They are real communiques to God. But the consciousness of the individual is highly questionable because the other side of this coin is that there are descriptions and contextual proof in the revealed book of knowledge here of actual encounters with beings that are as real as you sitting in front of me. Talking to them, hearing them through your ears, even maybe causing you to sweat because of your surprise, your fear, your, your emotional condition in being shot. Mary, we're told in the Gospels, Mary, the Greek word there, if you read that narrative, you'll find she was trembling in fear when Gabriel appeared to her. All of a sudden, hey, Mary, you're favored with God. <laughs> what? And this being materializes. A real encounter. She literally saw him, talked to him, listened with her ears, and her, she even asked questions back, and he responded to her. So we have this situation where, in this particular case, Abram, in a vision, was contacted. And the, uh, the, the uh, Hebrew word here, chaza, uh, basically means it's perceived in contemplation. The, the, the event is perceived in thought, in the, in the context of of um, something that you behold or perceive in your mind. But now let's go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. Now, we fast forward a little bit. Abraham is 99 years old. And we see here in verse 1, the Lord, Raha. The Lord, Raha, literally appeared. to Abraham. He appeared. He materialized and showed himself, obviously in a form that Abraham could recognize, and in most cases, as a man talking to him. Later on, you'll see why I say that. Genesis 17, 1 through 7. Abraham was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and the Almighty God walked before me and be, and, he, and he, uh, he said here unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and you be perfect and I will make my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham, he fell on his face. God talked with him and he said, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of many nations. Neither shall your name anymore be called Abraham, but Ab uh, Abram, but Abraham for a father of many nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come out of you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in your generations from everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after me. And then he goes on here in verse 15, dropping down. And because he, he's actually talking to Abraham, the whole chapter 17 is about a discussion God has with Abraham about three primary subjects. The fact that who he is, he identifies who he is. Then he talks about his covenant in verse 10 and the fact that Abraham was going to be a very important part of re the recipient of that covenant. And then in verse 15, he changes the subject. He continues in the discussion and brings Sarai, his wife, into this and says her name is going to be changed to Sarah. He says in verse 15, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall be her name. And he said, I will bless her. Verse 17, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. <laughs> Get the 
picture of this. They're talking. He's 99 years old. And he, this being materializes in front of him, tells him he's going to have a kid. He's, he's, he's stricken with hilarity. He falls on his face laughing, it says. <laughs> they're, they're having a relationship here. He's being visited. He's having an encounter of the first kind. Read these stories, brethren. Get into them. Notice what's happening and understand these are real events that really occurred. And he's laughing. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to me? I'm 100 years old and Sarah's 90. <laughs> and Abraham said unto God, oh, look, what about Ishmael? Can't we just bring Ishmael into this? And you bless Ishmael. He's negotiating now. And so God says, you know what? Ishmael will be all right. He'll be taken care of and he goes down here through it. Verse 21, though, but my covenant is going to remain with Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. And Abraham, it says in verse 24, was 90 years old uh, and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh and he took Ishmael who was 13 and circumcised Ishmael but the, and the story goes on. So now Genesis 18, let's continue on here. Genesis 18 because this is, these are visitations one right after another. We've got the same thing happening again. The Lord appeared, Roha, Roha unto him in the plains of Mamre, sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes, that is, Abraham did, look and three men, they looked like men, were coming toward Abraham. Three of them. And when he saw them, he ran to meet him. Abraham ran out to meet him from the tent door, bowed himself before the ground. He said, my Lord, he recognized him. How did he recognize him? Because in verse chapter 17, he already knew him. He already knew how he looked. So he recognizes him now. Oh, I know. Oh, you're the Lord. See, he's got a relationship already. He doesn't know the other two guys, but he knows they're with him, you see. And so he goes, Lord, Lord, he says, if now I have found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray for you, uh, you from your servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. Wash your feet, rest yourself, take, chill a little bit, take, take some time with me. Let's talk. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts, uh, for therefore you shall uh, come to your servant. And they said, so do, as you said. Abraham ran to the tent of Sarah. He said, make ready, quickly, get something to eat, a fine meal, and make some cakes. And Abraham ran under the herd and he fetched a calf tender and good and gave it to the young man and he said hasten to dress it he took butter and milk and a calf and had dressed and set before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did I don't know how long that took but you know what we're reading here didn't take five minutes to do this took quite a while to do I mean it wasn't like they went down to Costco and picked up some food you know brought it back and put it on put it on the cooker I mean, they had to get the animal, they had to fetch it, they had to bleed it, to kill it, and so forth and so on, and they had to cook it. And so all this was going on, and he said unto him, where's Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, she's in the tent. He said, well, I will certainly return unto you according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah, your wife, she's going to have a son. Remember what I told you in chapter 17, Abraham? When you were 99, you're going to have a son. He's bringing back that conversation. They're, they're, they're having a relationship here. And now Sarah hears it. She laughs a little bit. And the Lord, you know, he says, why are you laughing? You know the rest of the story in that regard. But at any rate, uh, he goes down to verse 16 now. And he says here, the men rose up from thence, looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And he was actually thinking out loud here or he was, you know, basically we're getting into the, I, the mind of the Lord. He's thinking to Abraham, should I tell him or shouldn't I tell him what I'm going to do? Talking about Sodom. And he says here, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him 
that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because the sin is very grievous, I will now go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry in which it comes unto me, uh, and I will know. And the men turned their faces and went toward Sodom. So they split, the three of them. Two of them left, turned away, and started walking towards Sodom, the city in the plains. The Lord stayed with Abraham. The party of three split. And he goes on here, and he says, And the men turned, verse 22, uh, from thence, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, And then what does Abraham do? He launches into this negotiation with the Lord. Well, wait a minute. You're going to destroy Sodom? Wait, what, what if... Because Lot, remember, Lot was in Sodom. His, he had family in Sodom. He was concerned. So he tells the Lord, Look, well, if you've got 50 people in Sodom, will you save it? Uh, all right, all right, all right. Well, how about 40? <laughs> uh, all right. And he goes down the line here. And he keeps negotiating and negotiating. While he's negotiating, where are the other two guys? Or these angels? Where are they? They're on their way to Sodom. They're on their way to Sodom. Pick up the story, chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. That's why I say those two men were angels. They were angels all along. They were with the Lord. And those two angels went to Sodom as what you could say representatives, ambassadors on behalf of the heavenly kingdom of the Father in Christ who stayed with Abraham as the word at that time, talking to him and being negotiated with, but these two angels walking on to Sodom. You know the rest of the story on what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, but let's fast forward to Genesis 22 and continue on this encounters of the first kind with good and favored beings, non-human uh, beings. In chapter 22 and in verse 9 we read, And they came to a place which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there of uh, wood. Uh, let me see here. Oh, wait. This, yeah, this is the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. And uh, Abraham said, My son, my God will provide him. Now remember, Abraham's got a relationship with the Lord already. So he's feeling pretty good. He's feeling pretty good because God told him he's going to have a kid. Guess what? He had a kid, 99 years old. Isaac now is probably in his teens. So this is years later. Years have passed. And now they were, he was told, that is, Abraham was told to go sacrifice Isaac. And so he does. And that's where we pick up this story. And then when he's about to do it, uh, Isaac says, well, you know, Father, where's the lamb? And he says, my son, God will provide, verse 8 here, chapter 22, of a burnt offering. So they went both uh, of them together, verse 9, and they came to a place which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar. Isaac, being a very uh, obedient young man, allowed his father to tie him up. His father's well over 100 years old now. And if Isaac was 17, 18, you know, he, our Isaac right here, I wouldn't want to mess with him at 99 years old, you know, or 109 years old. <laughs> But he could have easily, I'm sure, told his father, hey, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? But he didn't. He didn't. And he allowed him to tie him up. And he was tied up. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to kill his son. And all of a sudden, the angel said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. <laughs> here I am. He heard him. He broke the veil. I don't know if he saw him. I don't know if he appeared. doesn't say. But he definitely heard him. And right at the minute, he stopped. Here I am. <laughs> he was not able to have to kill his son, even though he was willing to do it. Even though he was willing. And you know the rest of the story as you read down through here. I don't have the time to go through it. I'm just emphasizing the fact of these particular encounters and the fact of how these favored angels, good angels, have been interacting with God's people and human beings on and off when the need arose, when it was necessary to make certain adjustments along the way so that God's plan works out according to the script. This is a script. It's already written. God is on a mission. 
and he's going to make this come to fruition, like it or not. We have no choice in any of those decisions. Those decisions have already been made. So here's the script. Here's the revealed knowledge. This is the program. And what God has to do occasionally is he comes down and the record of the historical modifications, adjustments is right here in the Old and New Testaments. And we see that as we go through this narrative of the Bible. Genesis chapter 28. Let's go up to 28 here for a moment real quick. Genesis chapter 28 and um, in uh, verse... This is now Isaac. He calls Jacob. Jacob is the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. We're fast forwarding many years out ahead. Isaac sent Jacob away, verse 5. And uh, verse 12, we come down now to Genesis chapter 28. And in verse 12, we read, And Jacob dreamed, this is the dream of the ladder, set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to you will I give it, to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, the east, the north, and the south. And in all you and in your seed shall all the families be blessed of the earth, or be, the earth be blessed. And so there lies an embedded prophecy of, of Jesus Christ coming out of the tribe of Judah, which of course was Abraham's loins by extension through Isaac and Jacob, who had his son Judah, of which Christ was uh, one from the tribe of Judah. Chapter 31, here in chapter 31, and in verse 11, again, just once more, illustrating to you that how God communicates. He communicates in appearance, but he also communicates in dreams and visions. Here's another description of a dream. And the angel God spoke unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up now your eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle and the ring speckled uh, uh, and, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban does unto you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you vowed a vow unto me. Now arise, get you out of this land. Return unto the land of your kindred and Rachel and Leah. And so he's giving him instruction, emboldening him. So when he woke up, he was in his mind fully convinced the decision to depart from Laban after the years that he had worked for both Rachel and Leah were indeed the right thing and were within God's will. And that all happened not through a visitation, but a dream, but a dream. But again, nevertheless, breaking in, into Jacob's mind in that contemplative fashion was uh, uh, convincing enough for him that afforded him the emboldenment, the courage to go ahead and do what he felt was the right thing to do thereafter. However, chapter 35, book of Genesis, verse 9, look at this one. Jacob still is the man here uh, in the spotlight. God, Raha, appeared. He broke the veil. He literally appeared again, manifested as he did to Abraham and as he did uh, to Isaac. And he appeared to Jacob in uh, Pandarum and blessed him, verse 9 now, verse 10, and God said unto him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. And God said to him, and here's where he breaks up the birthrighted promises. I am God Almighty. I am El. That's what he says. I am El Almighty. Like El. The El in Hebrew, El means God. Almighty, the mighty one. I am the mighty one, he says. And uh, he goes on here. Um, be fruitful, multiply. A nation and company of nations shall be of you and royalty kings shall come out of your loins and of course then uh, the rest of the story there 37 chapter 37 and in verse 5 Jacob's son Joseph Jacob's son Joseph 
Abraham had a son Isaac who had a son Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons was Joseph. Look at this. And Joseph, verse 5, dreamed a dream. And he told his brother, and it got him in trouble too, by the way, and they hated him for it. <laughs> but that's another story. Point being here, though, God again, when Joseph, look at this, verse 2, Joseph was only 17 years old when God broke the veil and spoke through a dream into the ears of Joseph to let Joseph know, this is what I want. This is what is going on. This is within my will. God using these visitation methods, dreams and visions, and literally manifested appearances where you sat down and talked, you saw. You, you literally fall on your face and you're laughing. They're laughing together. They're eating together. They're eating together. They could eat. Amazing. Think about that. It's amazing, brethren, when you really get down into these things. Let's go over here to Exodus. Let's get out of Ge uh, Genesis. And uh, let's go to Exodus. This, uh, there's so much material here, brethren. I, I found this, uh, this whole thing, uh, this study, just so fascinating. From Exodus chapter 3, reading on here, uh, onwards, from 3, uh, where Moses, um, the angel of the Lord, verse 2, appeared unto him in the flame of a fire out of the midst of a bush. Chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say the Lord has not appeared unto you. Because remember when Moses went, went to um, Pharaoh, I'll, I'll just jump ahead here a little bit, he said, I met with God. That word met means I had an encounter with God. I had a visual meeting face to face. You know, iPhones, face to face. I had a face to face. I saw him. And now here, before all that happened, Moses is already anticipating that he's not going to be believed. And so God gives him some instructions here on how to go ahead and handle that. Point being here, he did it face to face with Moses. Chapter 6, uh, chapter 5, uh, and they said, God of the Hebrews has met with us. There, there's what I was talking about and referencing with, um, with Pharaoh in regards to Moses' reference that he literally had a meeting with, uh, with God. Um, here in the um, chapter 6 book of Exodus, God says to Moses and says unto him, I am the Lord. I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by the name of El Almighty but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them but now I'm making myself known to you Moses to you and 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 rightly so because Moses had quite a relationship with Yahweh or Yehovah or as we understand the word known as uh, later on uh, Jesus Christ chapter 33 I want to make this point brethren over here chapter 33 where we find Israel Israel um, or uh, Moses and again God in discussion uh, the Lord said verse 5 unto Moses Say to the children of Israel, you're stiff-necked. Verse 6, the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments in Mount Horeb. Moses took the tabernacle, pitched it without the camp afar off. Verse 8, it came to pass when Moses went out of the tabernacle, all the people rose up, stood every man at his tent door, looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. It came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended, stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people, Raha, it's translated now instead of appeared, it's translated saw. Same Hebrew word, Raha. The people saw the cloud. They literally saw the manifestation of this cloud. And the cloudy pillar stand in the tabernacle door. All the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Notice this though. 
the Lord spoke to Moses in, inside, face to face. As a man speaks to his friend. Wow! That is stunning when you think about it. An encounter of the first kind, brethren. This being coming from his heavenly abode, manifesting himself and talking to a human being as a friend with confidence and trust, heart to heart, about his pleasure and his satisfaction that he had with what Moses was doing. And Moses talking, Moses, because I stood the daughter. That was Moses. That's why Aaron had to be by his side, because Aaron could talk a little bit better than Moses. You were always kind of on edge with Moses because you're say it. But but Moses was a very humble guy, a very humble guy. And he spoke here, and and God gave him uh, certainly a lot of kudos uh, for that. Numbers, let's, let's advance here. Look at this, Numbers chapter 12. Look at this one. Numbers chapter 12. Miriam and uh, Aaron spoke against Moses because he had married basically an Ethiopian, a woman of a different color, a woman outside of, outside of Israel and the ethnicity of Israel. And so he says here, uh, that uh, we uh, read here that he was, he was looked down upon by Miriam and Aaron, his brother, for he had married the Ethiopian woman. This is 13 or 12, verse 1, verse 2 now. They said, has the Lord indeed spoke only by Moses? And they're undermining him. Now the man Moses was a very meek man above all men which were upon the face of the earth. The Lord spoke suddenly to Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out, you three under the tabernacle of the congregation. Whoa. They're being taken out to the tool shed. They're being taken out to the tool shed. Come on out. I used to have a saying with my girls when they were bad. I used to say, let's go to the den. You know. Well, they're being taken. They're they're being taken to the den here in this particular case. And he says here, uh, the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud. That's how he manifested himself here and stood in the door of the tabernacle called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. He said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. That's one way. If there's a prophet among you, I will talk to him in visions and in dreams. But God is on a mission here. He wants to draw a distinction. But my servant, he says, My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all my house? With him I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. In other words, he shall see my image. He will hear my voice and he will see my similitude. He goes on here and he says, Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against Moses? The anger of the Lord was kindled against Miriam, and Aaron and he departed the cloud departed from off the tabernacle Miriam became leprous immediately and then Moses you know the story went to bat for her and God was pretty affirmative on this and so Moses cried unto the Lord verse 13 he said heal her now oh God I beseech you heal her and the Lord said unto Moses if her father had but spit in her face should she not be ashamed even seven days Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. In other words, what she did, even for spitting, she should suffer something for consequence. So let her stay out of the camp seven days. That was God's decision. God held Miriam responsible and accountable for her actions. Over here, as we end this up, Judges. Judges. Over here uh, in the book of Judges, chapter 13. Judges, chapter 13. The birth of Samson. The birth of Samson. Here is a woman living in Israel. Has no idea. Just living her life. She's just living her life. Verse 1. The children of Israel did evil. The nation. 
again, this, again uh, evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. God allowed Israel to be uh, overrun by the Philistines, and they were under the heel of the Philistines for 40 years in this particular case. And that was the setting of Samson and his life. But he goes on here. There was a certain man, Zorah, of the family of the Danites from the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren. She could not have children. And the angel of the Lord, Raha, appeared, broke the veil, and appeared, and showed itself to the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, you are barren, and don't bear anything, or bear us not but you shall conceive and bear a son. Wow, a visitation, an encounter of the first kind. First Samuel, first Samuel, chapter 28, chapter 28. Saul, king of Israel, is putting the, what you could say, rap, on all sorcerers and witches. He is putting his foot down and literally killing them all out of the land of Israel. That's the setting of this particular situation here in chapter 28. Now, Samuel the prophet, not Saul the king, Samuel the prophet was dead. You find out Samuel was dead, verse 3. Samuel was dead. If you understand revealed knowledge of where the dead are, they're sleeping in the graves. They're not immortal spirits floating around in another dimension to be called forward. The Bible makes it very clear for a reason. They want you to know that Samuel was dead. And if you understand the, the real meaning of death and the, con, the revealed knowledge of what death is, where the dead are, based on your Bible's definition, revealed knowledge, then you know what is about to be described is not Samuel. Because Samuel is dead. So keeping that in mind, and knowing the dead know nothing, there's no praise of God, they don't go to heaven, they don't go to hell, there's no such thing in your Bible. The dead die and go to sleep, and they wait for the resurrection. Samuel was sleeping in the grave, but he's dead, he's dead. And so we're told there in verse 3. Now, Saul was upset because the Philistines, verse 4, were gathering themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. There was going to be a fight, a war, and Saul, the king, wanted to know who was going to win. Saul inquired of the Lord, but the Lord wasn't answering him because the Lord was not uh, in his dreams, nor by uh, Urim, nor by the prophets. There was no t contact with God for Saul because Saul was on the outs with God. Then said Saul unto his servants, you seek me a woman who's got a familiar spirit. I need a channeler. I need a sorceress. I need somebody that can talk to the other side. That's what Saul was looking for that I may go to her, inquire of her and his servants, and said to him, Behold, there's a woman that has a familiar spirit in Endor. Saul disguised himself. He didn't want to be recognized as a king because then she'd be scared because she knew the edict was all over the place. The king was killing all the sorcerers and witches, and she was one. So she was in hiding. But at any rate, Saul disguised himself, put on some raiment, went two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray you, divine unto me, by the familiar spirit, bring me him up whom I shall name unto you. The woman said unto him, Behold, you know not what uh, Saul has done. She didn't recognize him. Sir, you don't know what the king has done, what Saul has done, how he has cut off all those with familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. Wherefore, then layest thou a snare for my life? Are you trying to trap me? Are you, are you, you, you wearing a, are you wearing a, a mic? <laughs> you know, are you wired? What are you trying to do, entrap me here? She was afraid. And Saul, uh, Saul swore to her, no, 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 no. By the Lord, I say, I swear to you by God. That's what he's saying, essentially. As the Lord lives, there shall no punishment happen to you for this thing. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up? And he said, bring me up, Samuel. Verse 3. 
Now Samuel was dead. Bring me up Samuel. Oh. The woman saw Samuel. She cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, uh, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Let's read that again. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. What are you reading there? You're reading that that familiar spirit actually must have told her you're talking to Saul. And she yelled because now she knows, oh no, the king's in front of me and he's killing all people like me. And the king said unto her, don't be afraid. For what did you see? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, He's an old man. He's coming up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground. And he bowed. And Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disquieted me to bring me up? The demon's talking. This, this angelic connection is talking. Saul's dead. Or Samuel's dead. I'm sorry. Samuel's dead. Saul's talking though to something. Something is trying to mimic or what you could say um, make Saul believe that it is. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed for the Philistines are going to make war against me and God's not, uh, God has departed from me and answers me no more either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have called you and you may make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, or this, of course, being non-human that wants to be believed as Samuel, Wherefore have you asked me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done to him as he spoke to me, for the Lord has rent the kingdom. And that was really the news that Saul was getting and given it to David. But the point of it is, this being was more than happy to talk to Saul. Because Samuel, your Bible said, was dead. So we know this was not Samuel. Brethren, I could go on and talk about Job chapter 2 where Satan the devil comes up to uh, God the Father's throne in that area there of heaven talking about Job and how he came up with the rest of the angels on that day and God allowed certain things in Job's life to occur to test Job. There are so many other scriptures that I could talk about in the New Testament. There's a whole battery of scriptures. If you've got a pencil and a paper, I'd like to share some of these with you real quickly here because time is running out on me. But I want to mention chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 11. Chapter 12, verse 22 through 26. Matthew 15, 22. Mark 7, 26 through 30. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Mark 5, the whole chapter. Mark 5, the whole chapter of the man who had multiple demons in him. And they talked to Jesus. And they said, what do you want to do with us, Lord Jesus? And he said, go into the pigs, because they said they didn't want to leave. You know that story. And there were multiple beings, non-human beings, living in this particular man. All I'm trying to make the point, I'm not trying to scare anybody, just trying to make a point, brethren. There are non-human beings amongst us that do indeed interact with human beings. And in the book of your Bibles, the books of your Bible, that information in revealed knowledge is there in multiple fashions and forms with a tremendous amount of edification for all of you to learn from. Luke 9, verse 37 through 42. John 13. And Jude, here's one, Jude, where he talks about how the angels that left their first estate and then talking about Moses' body. Remember, Moses didn't go into the promised land. 
His body, he, he, he watched the Israelites under the leadership of Joshua cross the Jordan and go into the promised land that he never saw. And as they, he stood there and watched them disappear at 120 years old or however old he was at that time because I think he died at about 120 years old, Moses did. Moses turned around and walked off while Israel went on into the promised land. Moses died. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, Hillel, knew where that body was. He came down, he wanted to take that body for some reason. I don't know if he wanted to take the bones and use them as idolatrous uh, items that he was going to confuse people with even more. Who knows what he wanted it for, but Michael wasn't going to allow it. And Michael came down and tried to stop him. You can read about this in the book of Jude. This was an actual event that occurred. And these two beings in the physical realm, because don't forget, Moses' body is physical. It's laying in the dirt, dying. How long it's been dead, I don't know, before Satan arrived, but there's Moses, and Moses couldn't bury himself, so obviously he had to, you know, perhaps be exposed unless some angels came down and buried the body. Don't know that either. But the point of it is, Satan knew where the body was, Satan wanted the body, and Michael wasn't going to have anything to do with it, so he tried to stop it. Jude reports it, and guess what? We're told he had to call Christ to rebuke Satan to get him off that mission, which he did. And Moses' body remains to this day unknown and never, never disrupted. But there's so much here. All these scriptures, they illustrate such enormous, brethren, enormous interaction uh, with the demonic world and spirit beings uh, that are non-human existing, existing alongside us. And the Bible reveals they are able to cross over constantly. And all those New Testament scriptures that I don't have time to really cover that I'd like to cover illustrates they have crossed over. They interact. They cause people pain. They cause people to foam at the mouth. We're even told that in some cases, and not all cases, don't take me out of, out of context here, but in some cases can even cause deafness and blindness. Sicknesses, they can cause sicknesses. Not all cases, don't get me wrong. And, and don't you know, get uh, too overly uh, concerned about this. I'm not saying that all blind people are demon possessed. I'm not saying that. Or all people that can't hear are demon possessed. I'm not saying that. And I, and I want you to understand that clearly. But what I am saying is the Bible indicates it's a possibility. From time to time, that can happen. Because if you want to call these things up and entertain them and include them as part and parcel to your life and think you're going to have fun with them, think again. These disfavored angels are very powerful and would like to have nothing more than to have their way with you if they can. Stay away from them. Don't even think about them. Lose sight of them and rather pray that the good ones are all around you because in due respect over here in Hebrews chapter 13, we need to keep in mind very quickly here, uh, chapter 13 and in verse 1, let brotherly love continue, brethren. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels in unaware. You come up on a person, you don't know who they are, you have a little interaction with them, and lo and behold, who knows? It could be an angel. It should be good to all people. We should be kind to all people. Everybody's our neighbor because you never know. You just never know how God is interplaying with you, how many times God has protected you, how many bullets figuratively speaking have you missed that you don't even know about in your life whether it was an accident and he allowed you to veer off in such a way or whether there was a little delay on something so that when you weren't uh when you were there it didn't happen yet you, we don't know these things we have no idea how much God interacts with our lives in the way of bringing ideas to our mind or thoughts to lose weight, to go on a, on a diet, to change our diets, to get exercise, to meet new people, to change a career. I'm sure that in your life you can look at certain things in your life and see God, I hope, working in your life and articulating certain venues by which you, making the decisions you've made and having the courage to make them, have gone that way and have been blessed for it. I know I have, and I know I can look in my life to see some of these things. But here's my point, and, and this really is uh, what I'm trying to get to. A lot of the stories we hear, brethren, a lot of the things that you may just dismiss and try to marginalize, frankly, could very well be real. They could very well be supernatural. 
but they aren't from aliens from Mars or little, you know, people from another galaxy somewhere coming in on a spaceship. No, 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 no. They are angelic beings, good or bad, interacting, breaking the veil, and coming through for whatever reason, for whatever reason, their mission may be. And I emphasize the fact, good as well as bad. Because sometimes, good ones do manifest as well. I was trying to find the story of the gentleman in the World Trade Center who claims that he was helped to get out of the building that it was falling by somebody, but then when he got out, he couldn't find that person. I couldn't find the story, but I've heard of that story that happened. I was looking on for that story last night on the internet, trying to get it so I could read it to you, which I don't have any time to read anyway, but <laughs> I was going to try to read it. But that was a story of a gentleman who basically came out of the World Trade Center's collapse with the help of somebody, of which then when he was out, wanted to thank, and couldn't find him. No trace of him. Gone. Disappeared. Who was that? Who are the people that are out on a boat? You know, you've read World War II, some of these guys on life rafts, and all of a sudden they need food. And one story I think I re vaguely remember about a bunch of birds just falling in on the raft. How'd that happen? Do angels interact with human beings, good ones and bad ones? Absolutely they do, brethren. They do. They do. And it's God's prerogative to direct and to manage that interaction as he sees fit according to his plan in our own personal lives as well as on the broad scope of the prophetic scenario that he's working here on this planet. So keep this in mind in the book of James, I'll close here, and that is that mankind, if they would just believe revealed knowledge, really would have a lot of answers to a lot of the befuddlement that they have over some of the things that they can't physically explain or scientifically support. But many questions would be certainly answered about aliens and UFOs if they could just recognize revealed knowledge uh, that is contained in your Bible. Man has, is, and will continue, man has, is, and will continue to be visited by non-human beings. He will be until Christ lands on this earth and then they will continue to interact with planet Earth on a different level. But what they are, brethren, are not, are not in any way, shape, or form from another planet. I want to make that clear. They are angelic beings falling into two categories primarily, good and bad angels. Both are good, or uh, both categories, uh, good or favored or unfavored, but make no mistake, make no mistake on this. These angels exist. They do exist. They are alive. I like to think that good angels, in fact, from time to time, come to church services once in a while just to hang out. Nothing wrong with that because it's God's people. And certainly God's angels are welcome in every way, shape, or form. But keep this in mind, in the latter days, and we all know this, unfortunately, the disfavored ones are going to become more predominant. They're going to become more predominant in people, and I can see that by the fact of human beings chopping the heads off of other human beings thinking they're doing a favor of God. It's the most macabre, irrational, nonsensical activity to attribute an act of beheading another human being to God. It's atrocious. It's unconscionable to attribute such a thing as flying airplanes into buildings and crying out that God be great, God be good. It's insane. It is a religion of death. And you cannot, you cannot rationalize it because it comes from a world of demonic influence that is doomed, doomed. So keep this in mind. As you continue in your life, chapter 4 of the book of James, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil in your lives. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall. In other words, humble yourselves. Don't think that you have this all down pat because you don't. Humble yourselves and God 
will indeed lift you up.